Throughout the centuries, there have been many mysteries that have baffled the human mind. Reincarnation, ghosts, poltergeists, prophecy, extrasensory perception, healing. In this program, in our Mysteries of Time and Space series, we will explore the mystery of UFOs and extraterrestrial visitation. My name is Brad Steiger. I will serve as your guide to this mystery of time and space. One of the basic questions that any thinking man or woman eventually asks is, are we alone in the universe? And people of our generation have not been the first to ask such a question of the mighty expanse of the heavens above us. Unfortunately, far too often, humankind has reflected its own negativism, hostility, and aggressiveness by portraying possible alien visitors as monsters from outer space, intent upon doing our planet great menace and harm. Recently, when a wave of mysterious cattle mutilations began to sweep the western United States, several investigators concluded that occupants from UFOs had to be responsible. When creatures such as Bigfoot are sighted, they are often linked to UFOs. If witnesses of UFO activity appear to suffer a certain peculiar kind of harassment, some researchers immediately suggest that sinister entities from other worlds or dimensions may be involved. While there may be many facets of mystery involved in the UFO enigma, those ufologists who seriously investigate such phenomena have begun to suspect a much larger, more profound purpose to it all. Although the newspapers in 1897 were filled with accounts of a strange airship that had perplexed thousands of eyewitnesses in the United States and overseas, and although it is quite likely that the UFO phenomenon has been with us ever since we became human, it was not until June 24, 1947, with Kenneth Arnold's sighting near Mount Rainier, Washington, that the UFO mystery was reborn in modern times. For nearly 40 years now, the controversy over the UFO, its purpose, its place of origin, and the true nature of its involvement with Earth has continued to rage. Do they come from outer space? Perhaps from a neighboring planet such as Mars? or from farther away, such as Andromeda, or the Pleiades. If the euphonauts are extraterrestrials, then it appears that they have had Earth under surveillance for centuries, and that they have chosen to keep their principal activity secret for some undetermined reason. How long has Earth been under surveillance? This geode may hold a clue. On February 13, 1961, three rock hounds picked up a number of geodes in the Costco Mountains near Olancha, California. When they at last managed to saw a very stubborn geode in half, they found that it contained a perfectly circular section of hard ceramic with a two millimeter shaft of bright metal in its center. A trained geologist told them that the fossil encrustations on the outside were at least 500,000 years old. Whatever was on the inside of the Najo had to be a whole lot older. X-ray photos of the geo reveal an object definitely man-made. Sliced in two, we see a hexagonal metallic frame, a porcelain or ceramic insulator with a central metallic shaft, elements which some researchers have suggested are the basic components of a spark plug or some electronic device over 500,000 years old. Certain ufologists have insisted that the UFO occupants are actually members of terrestrial Air Force units conducting top secret military maneuvers with classified aerial vehicles. In the famous Socorro, New Mexico sighting by policeman Lonnie Zamora, the euphonauts gave us a glimpse of an insignia on the side of their craft and drove the U.S. Air Force cryptographers crazy trying to match it with a craft of the U.S. Navy, a foreign power, 
or some vast military industrial complex. A closely related theory to the military secret hypothesis has the UFOs belonging to a secret society of scientists alchemists who centuries ago developed an advanced technology which they have managed to keep hidden in underground or undersea cities. And that theory is only one step away from the hypothesis that suggests that both the UFOs and their occupants are nothing more than holographic projections or elaborate special effects that are being created by some unknown agency for some ulterior and as yet undetermined motive. A rather popular theory maintains that the euphonauts may be our descendants from the future, actually studying us by using our present, their past, as a living historical museum. Time travel postulates all sorts of problems in physics and logic, but if it could be advanced far enough, this theory might explain such enigmas as the following. These man tracks were found in situ with the tracks of the giant dinosaurs. We are told that the ancestors of humankind are no older than three or four million years, yet the great reptiles became extinct 80 million years ago. Dr. Clifford Burdick has spent more than 30 years studying what appear to be human footprints in strata contemporaneous with dinosaur tracks. In 1975, Dr. Stanley Ryan of the University of New Mexico announced his discovery of human-like tracks in strata indicative of 40 million years old. Did time travelers from our future leave these tracks as they visited our mutual past and the time machines that we call UFOs? Or did that surveillance of which we spoke earlier begin millions of years ago. A related hypothesis states that the UFO entities come not from some other physical world, but rather from an adjacent space-time continuum. In other words, the UFOs actually coexist with us on Earth, but on another vibrational level. Well, if the dimensions ever cross, and quite obviously they do, or we wouldn't see UFOs at all, Maybe the other dimensions hypothesis explains such artifacts as this beautifully wrought object that was discovered inside of solid pudding stone 15 feet below the surface near Dorchester, Massachusetts. The bell-shaped vessel is four and a half inches high, six and a half inches at the base, two and a half inches at the top, and about an eighth of an inch thick. The metallic composition is brass with zinc, iron, and lead. The inlay is pure silver. Since its discovery, some of the world's finest and most complete laboratories have run the vessel through every conceivable kind of test. There is still no answer to its period of historicity or its origin. Certain ufologists have stated their beliefs that at least some UFOs may actually be unrecognized life forms indigenous to the upper reaches of the Earth's atmosphere. They may be plasmic, electrical, nearly pure energy forms which have the ability to assume a variety of guises. Others suggest that the UFOs may be something more on the order of ghosts rather than visitors from outer space. They have theorized that maybe our entire planet is haunted, so to speak, by some as yet unknown physical law that can at times activate or be activated by the unconscious mind. This law or energy might not itself be intelligent, but it would be able to absorb, reflect, and imitate human intelligence. For instance, this ghostly bulb snatcher appeared in a brand new home in Lake Tahoe. This picture is not a double exposure, and it clearly shows the image of a man steadying the wagon wheel chandelier and removing or unscrewing the light bulb. The proud owner of the new home had been perplexed by the light bulbs becoming loose in their sockets. It wasn't until this picture was developed that he learned the reason why. 
Now, you have to deal with this photograph in your own reality, of course. But some night when you're sitting up late reading and the wind is howling outside the window, the rain is hitting against the pane, and the light goes out beside you, remember this picture. A somewhat more profound theory suggests that the UFOs may be quasi-real objects manufactured by the human collective unconscious. Researcher John White views Jungian archetypes as energetic thought fields that are accessible through dreams, meditations, and other altered states of consciousness. White theorizes that there may be larger, previously unrecognized dimensions of physical events in which highly evolved entities exist on a grander paraphysical scale and influence and guide human affairs. It may be this grander paraphysical dimension that has been guiding men and women recently through such manifestations as materializations of the great mother image, which we have investigated in numerous instances. For example, is this image that of a spaceship or the blessed mother? Audiences are about equally divided in their appraisals. It was taken at the Florida Space Center by Dr. Berthold Schwarz. More cynical researchers theorize that we are indeed being visited by extraterrestrials, but that they are tricksters who are deliberately misleading humankind in order to provide a cover for undisclosed activities on Earth. A theory that seems quite provocative holds that UFO manifestations are the result of the magical machinations of elves, we people, and other paraphysical entities that have coexisted with humankind as companion species and who appear to participate somehow with Homo sapiens in an evolutionary design. For centuries, it is true, the UFOs have been scorching clearings in the woods and leaving fairy circles. They've been doing the same thing in farmers' pastures. In this instance, the Iowa farmer who complained to us was upset because he thought the UFOs he saw nestling down in his pasture were somehow drawing electricity from the power lines, and he was afraid that he would get stuck with the bill. On July 1st, 1965, Maurice Massé, a farmer near Valenso, France, was rendered temporarily immobile until the strange elf-like trespassers in his field made their getaway. The euphonauts have been pulling this trick for years. Perhaps that's where we get the stories of the wee people and their magic wand. On a rainy night in July 1969, a glowing oval-shaped UFO settled down in Warren Barr's bean field in Iowa Cedar River Valley. Teenagers Pat Barr and her visiting cousin Kathy Marr saw the object as they were preparing for bed. Barr discovered the 40-foot in diameter scorched circle the next morning when he was doing chores. The UFO researchers who investigated reports of an alien craft on a Florida beach found what may be the impression of a landing gear. Nearby were what appeared to be corrugated, dumbbell-shaped footprints. Both in UFO literature and in the cases which I have personally investigated, the most often reported ETs are described as being about five feet tall, large-headed, with oversized, strangely slanted eyes, sometimes with reptilian-type vertical pupils. The entities are usually said to be dressed in close-fitting, one-piece jumpsuits. Very often, the witnesses notice a winged serpent shoulder patch on the euphonaut's uniforms or observe such an object in a medallion or other insignia. I saw an entity such as this when I was five years old. It occurred in our Iowa farm. I was seated on the edge of the bed one October evening, and I heard the sound of someone dragging a wash tub over under the kitchen window. As I looked in that direction, I saw a smallish entity standing up on his tiptoes, peering in at my parents who were in the kitchen. 
I watched the being for quite some time, feeling a kind of anticipation and awe. And then the watcher must have felt as though he was being watched. And then he turned to look at me, and we made eye-to-eye -eye contact. I have never forgotten the moment when we looked at one another eye-to-eye -eye at a distance of probably seven to eight feet. It seemed as though the entity's eyes began to get larger and larger and larger. And I became very tranquil, very much at peace. And then I knew nothing else until I awakened the next morning. This is the way patrolman Herb Shermer sketched the UFO occupants he encountered outside of Ashland, Nebraska, shortly after midnight on December 3rd, 1967. They were from four and a half to five and a half feet tall, Shermer told us. Their uniforms were silver gray, very shiny. Their suits came up around their heads like a pilot's cap. On the right side of their helmets, they had a small antenna just above where the ear would be. Their chests were bigger than ours. They were built very wiry and muscular. Their eyes were the one thing that I will never forget. The pupil went up and down like a slit. When they looked at me, they stared straight into my eyes. They didn't blink. It was real uncomfortable. Their noses were flat. Their mouths looked more like a slit than a regular mouth. Betty and Barney Hill were returning to their home in New Hampshire from a vacation in Canada when they noticed a bright light in the night sky of September 19, 1961. Confused and unable to explain his distress to his wife, Barney unexplainably drove off the main road to a side road where they found five humanoids blocking their path. Then, as if they had suddenly become marionettes under another's control, Betty and Barney Hill found themselves being taken to the UFO by the humanoids. Two hours later, the Hills were returned to their automobile, at which time the humanoids told them that they would forget all about their abduction. The remarkable confrontation with an alien species would probably never have been brought to public attention had it not been for two factors. Both Betty and Barney were troubled by bizarre, inexplicable dreams, and they had discovered an unaccountable two-hour gap in their journey home from Canada. A common pattern for confrontations with ETs might be sketched out in the following way. One, the witness observes a craft landing and beings emerging from its interior. Two, when the beings notice him or her, the witness very often becomes panic-stricken and may even enter a state of shock. Three, as the entities approach this stunned person, the witness now experiences a state of tranquility. Four, the witness becomes aware of a process of communication either telepathically or verbally, occurring between himself or herself and the euphonauts. Five, the beings return to the craft, occasionally after taking some object from or leaving some object with the witness. Six, the craft lifts off into the sky, whereupon the witness may lapse back into his or her former state of fear or confusion. Such a pattern as the one that I have described above has led me to speculate that the UFO entities may be able to transmit tranquility to the witness only when in close range. Perhaps the reason for this lies in vibrations or feelings that emanate from the euphonaut's auric bodies rather than a telepathically transmitted message of peacefulness. On October 17, 1973, Jeff Greenhaw police chief of Falkville, Alabama, responded to a call about a spacecraft with blinking lights. Chief Greenhaw was unable to locate the alien vehicle, but he did see a creature dressed in metallic spacesuit standing in the middle of the road. According to Greenhaw, I got out of my patrol car and said, howdy, stranger, but he didn't say a word. I reached back and got my camera and started taking pictures of him. The entity didn't seem to mind posing for the camera, but he ran away when Chief Greenhaw turned on the blue light atop his cruiser. 
Late in the afternoon on November 5th, 1975, seven Forest Service workers were returning from woodcutting work in the White Mountains of northeastern Arizona. When they spotted a large, glowing, oval UFO hovering over a clearing, 22-year-old Travis Walton did not hesitate to walk nearer for a careful inspection of the object. The tall young man was standing directly beneath the vehicle when a ray of blue light beamed down and struck him. The last thing the six young men in the truck saw before they floored the accelerator and fled the scene was the sight of Travis Walton spread-eagled at the end of a blue ray. There would be no more Travis Walton for five days until he called his brother Bruce from a telephone booth on the outskirts of Heber, 12 miles from the spot where he had disappeared. One of the most thoroughly researched and most controversial E.T. abduction cases in modern times was launched when Travis Walton told the press that he had been aboard a UFO all that time. The entities were about five feet tall, Walton declared. They had large golden eyes set beneath domed foreheads. Although he never saw their small, compressed mouths open, he was aware of communication from the entities through telepathy. In the late 1960s, I presented my hypothesis that the reason why the most frequently reported euphonauts resemble reptilian or amphibian humanoids may be because that is exactly what they are, highly evolved members of a serpentine or semi-aquatic species. A provocative theory is that the dinosaurs didn't really vanish, they evolved into a humanoid culture that eventually ran its course or was destroyed in an Atlantis-type catastrophe, perhaps just after they had begun exploring extraterrestrial frontiers. The UFO occupants seen today, then, may be the descendants of the survivors of that reptilian culture who are returning to monitor the present dominant species, Homo sapiens sapiens, on the planet. Or, as an alternate hypothesis, Today's euphonauts may be a highly advanced reptilian humanoid culture from an extraterrestrial world. These serpent people would have evolved into the dominant species on their planet millions of years ago and would have become space explorers eons of Earth years ago. These same reptilian humanoids may have interacted in our world's evolution as genetic engineers, culture bearers, and silent observers of our resultant progress as a species. I have developed this hypothesis considerably for my book, The Seed, so I was delighted when I received word that Dale Russell and Ron Sequin of Canada's National Museum of Natural Sciences at Ottawa had fashioned a model of a humanoid dinosaur using Stenonchosaurus inequalis as their inspiration. Stenonchosaurus, according to Russell, had a rather large brain and eyes with overlapping visual fields. The 90-pound dinosaur also walked on two legs, and it appears to have had a partially opposable thumb on its three-clawed hand. The result of such scientific speculation was an astonishingly human-like creature that Russell terms a dinosauroid. The creature stands four and a half feet tall, has a large domed head, green skin, and yellow reptilian eyes. It should probably have had ears, Russell conceded, but the effect would have made it appear too human. As it is, the dinosaur man on display at Canada's National Museum of Natural Sciences almost exactly fits the descriptions of euphonauts provided by thousands of men and women throughout the planet who have reported their close encounters with ETs. In the summer of 1982, producer-director Steven Spielberg introduced theater audiences to an extraterrestrial entity who literally lives on the love energy and who is apparently a member of a species that has been monitoring our planet to check out the soil and the flora and fauna. E.T. is definitely in the amphibian reptilian mold, 
and the motion picture is an excellent device for teaching young people to respect intelligences that may appear very different from them in physical structure. My wife Francie was told several years ago that extraterrestrial intelligences would begin using our media to begin a program of positive conditioning to prepare Earth men and women for large-scale UFO landings. Steadily, the population of our planet would perceive an interaction with an alien species as a mutually profitable experience. Such positive propagandizing was necessary after the wars of the worlds, which frightened us so in the early science fiction dramas that were presented by radio, television, and motion pictures. If some researchers find links between the fairy folklore and the UFOs, then it is to be expected that about an equal number will make an association between the euphonauts and the angels, which are described by many religions as the messengers of God. The theory puts forth the concept that if these intelligences were concerned with the guidance and the salvation of early members of humankind, why should they not maintain such concern today? An entity such as this materialized to Francie when she was about five years old. He sang talk to her of her mission in life. He identified himself in earth terms as an angel. Francie remains in constant contact and communication with the entity. And she has since learned that his name is Kaif. Her contact with this being has proved to her that there is an intelligence external to humankind that cares about our spiritual evolution. UFO researcher Hayden Hughes arranged for Francie to be tested by science's most sophisticated new instrument for assessing the truth of anyone's claims, the Psychological Stress Evaluator, the PSE. Developed by two colonels in military security, the PSE detects any stress-related tremors in the involuntary muscles triggered by the subconscious mind. In every instance tested, one of the nation's foremost PSE analysts declared that Francie was telling the truth about her experiences with the multidimensional beings that interact with her. Surely the sons of God, who are referred to in the Bible, may have been checking in on this developing planet for hundreds of millions of Earth years, almost as if they were tending a garden. In 1971, amateur archaeologist Lynn Ottinger found traces of human remains in a stratum approximately 100 million years old. Remember, those species called human are far less than one million years old, according to the official calendars. In the 1930s, Dr. Wilbur Greeley Burroughs, head of the geology department, Berea College, Kentucky, found 10 complete humanoid tracks in carboniferous sandstone. After an exhausting study of several years, he concluded that the tracks had been made by a, a bipedal creature that positioned its feet like that of a human had a heel and five toes, walked exclusively on its hind legs, and wore a size seven and a half double E shoes, 250 million years ago. On June 1st, 1968, William Meister discovered what appears to be a fossilized human sandal print in a Cambrian limestone formation near Antelope Springs, Utah. Overall, the print is ten and a half inches. Three and a half inches wide at the sole, three inches at the heel. The sandal is well worn on the right heel. The heel is indented about an eighth of an inch more than the sole, indicating a characteristic and natural distribution of weight. Look at the object that has been mashed by the heel. It is a trilobite the earliest fossil life form known to science. If this is truly a sandal print with a trilobite in its heel, found in Cambrian limestone of the Paleozoic era, it would have to be 500 million years old. 
Some investigators believe that the UFOs offer us yet another piece of evidence that at some level of the universe, we are all interconnected to each other and to other organisms and to other levels of consciousness in other worlds and in other dimensions. The existence of the UFO appears to prove that time, space, mass are not as confining as we have previously believed. The reality of the UFO seems to demonstrate that there are more dimensions than the physical time-space frame with which we are familiar. The truth of the UFO tells us once again that they are energies circulating on Earth and throughout the cosmos that, if properly balanced, can cause manifestations of great spiritual experiences and physical abilities. All physical considerations aside, the UFO is providing contemporary humankind with a vital, living, mythological symbol which communicates directly to the essential self, bypassing the brain, evading acculturation, and manipulating historical conditioning. The UFO may serve humankind as a transformative symbol that will unite our species as one spiritual organism, functioning through members who, though separate in space, are yet one in being and belief. But certainly the UFO is more than a symbol. It is physical enough to show up on radar, such as on this one that belongs to the Weather Bureau in Wichita, Kansas, or on Air Force radar. Note the interesting grouped formation of the UFOs. Here we are a few minutes later, watching the squad of UFOs seemingly expanding and contracting. In this photograph, a UFO in the upper right visits our base at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. Here, UFOs check in for an inspection of the Coast Guard facility at Salem, Massachusetts. This photograph was taken by a Coast Guardsman as he watched the UFOs through a screen door. Three classic UFO shapes were taken September 26, 1960, in Italy. And a variety cluster was snapped over Sheffield, England, on March 4, 1962. Hard UFOs, that is, UFOs that give a solid or metallic appearance, have been reported all over the world. In this chart, Artist Hal Crawford has drawn hypothetical models based upon thousands of UFO reports. There are flat bottom or concave bottom UFOs. There are discs, flattened spheres, ovals, teardrops, cigars, cubes, and crescents, to name a few. This general map indicating UFO density is based upon hundreds of reports dating back to the early 1800s. Consistently, year after year, UFO activity seems heaviest or lightest in the variously shaded areas. Electromagnetic cases are those instances in which a witness of UFO activity has reported interference with his automobile, his lights, and so forth. This map also indicates where blackouts and brownouts of cities took place in which UFOs were suspect. Also included are cases in which animals seem affected by the overflight of UFOs. Electromagnetic activity has occurred in these areas in what would seem to be cyclical patterns. This map represents those areas in which UFOs have been seen touching down time and again. Although humanoid entities and UFO occupants have been reported in every state, there appear to be specific areas which they favor in what seem to be cyclic patterns. Again, this map is based upon hundreds of sightings which date back to the early 1800s. Here is a world map of EM cases in shaded areas which we term strangeness places. These are regions in which humanoids, ghosts, strange creatures, and unexplained disappearances occur in what would seem to be cyclic manifestations. Over 20 years of research has led me to the conclusion that some external force or intelligence has interacted with humankind throughout history in an effort to learn more about us or in an effort to communicate certain 
basic truths to our species. I am also convinced that there is a subtle kind of symbiotic relationship that exists between humankind and these intelligences. In some as yet not fully understood way, they need us as much as we need them. The UFO intelligences seem to have the ability to influence the human mind telepathically and may project what appear to be three-dimensional images to the percipients of UFO activity. The image seen may depend in large part upon the preconceptions, fears, and hopes which the witnesses may have about alien life forms. That is why some witnesses of UFO activity may identify the intelligence as an invader from outer space, or a bug-eyed monster, or a light being. It may actually be a matter of the witnesses' prejudice, their level of technological sophistication, and their individual spiritual philosophy as to what form the UFO intelligence assumes. The really important thing to the UFONauts may be that someone sees them and interacts with them on some level, either conscious or unconscious. In 1968, while conducting a worldwide study of psychically talented men and women in an effort to determine a pattern profile for those people who demonstrate ESP, I discovered a number of individuals who seemed to have been programmed to serve as guides through the times of change and transition which many believe lie ahead for humankind. These men and women appeared to be responding to some kind of timed release mechanism within them. It was as if DNA nuclei were literally exploding inside their psyches, reminding them of an extraterrestrial ancestry and a responsibility toward the people of this planet. I called these men and women the star people, after the American Indian legends of those who came down from the stars to take unto themselves husbands and wives from the various tribes. Such accounts are recorded on petroglyphs and in the oral tradition of many Native American people. And I recognize the similarity of these tales to the verses in Genesis, which refer to the sons of God coming to the daughters of humankind and producing infants, which later became mighty men and women of great renown, giants in the earth. The pattern profile of the star people indicates an unusual visitation from a humanoid being, an angel, or a glowing white light around the age of five. Most of the star people have a lower than normal body temperature, extra or transitional vertebrae, chronic sinusitis, an unusual blood type, a hypersensitivity to light, sound, and electromagnetic vibrations, a yearning for a home not on earth, and a great conviction that now is the time to begin to prepare the planet for a metamorphosis into the future. When I met Francie, I not only discovered someone who fit nearly all of the many items on the pattern profile, but one who had isolated other elements which she could add to my list. Perhaps most importantly, she had maintained a close contact with the entity who had visited her when she was five and she could provide answers to my questions of why the ETs had visited our planet so long ago. Francie, at this point in your research and your quest on planet Earth, do you believe that ETs visited this globe in prehistory and are still visiting this planet today? Yes, I definitely do. I think it has been obvious with uh, Sumer and all of the cultures that have been affected with Egypt. They all spoke of uh, being visited by extraterrestrial beings. How did these ETs appear in those days, do you believe? I believe, <coughs> I believe they contacted us in uh, a lot of ways. I think that they probably used mental telepathy in some, since many were very advanced and others were physically contacting us. So many people say, you know, if the ETs are really there, why don't they contact people? Why, why don't they really come down and make themselves known? 
Yet you and, and many people such as yourself believe that you have made contact with ETs. Is that true? Yes, uh, we've made contact, I believe, with extraterrestrial beings that are perhaps multidimensional rather than the physical beings. There have been a few fortunate people that have made the physical contact uh, that are known as the contactees. I have not been so fortunate. I would welcome such a contact, and I imagine many of us would, but they are not allowed to truly overtly affect our uh, society in any way that would really set us back. We cannot uh, really take that type of contact with an advanced culture. Well, now, many people would welcome the kind of contact you have. Kaif gives practical information. Uh, I know he's even given phone numbers that we've needed from time to time. Who is Kaif then? Kaif is the masculine aspect of my higher self. Uh, we all have a feminine and a masculine aspect to our higher self or our soul. And it is the guiding aspect. It is the aspect that actually assists me in um, many, many ways, as you well know. And um, the masculine aspect of everyone actually helps and guides them throughout their lives. We can meditate and make contact with this higher self which is really a part of us, and uh, in so doing, find out so many more things that aren't available to us out of books on Earth. Now, when Kaif came to you when you were five, right. he told you he was an angel. Right. Is, is he an angel in, in the sense that we think of as angels? In the way that we know of angels, yes, I, without wings. He comes and goes very quickly. Um, he is all about God. He gives messages that actually are of God, uh, divine messages. And uh, in that way, uh, one could say he is very definitely angelic. Now, are you special in having this contact, or is this available for other people? Everyone can have this contact. Um, by meditating, especially uh, every day at a particular time is better, and by practicing um, what they tell you. Uh, they teach you of love, of loving all things unconditionally. Of oh, they, you mean these right. angelic type right. beings? Right, and they all speak of unconditional love. And uh, to love all living things, because everything is really a part of God. And they say things like, for instance, uh, that you can't possibly say that you love God if you do not love all living things, because all living things are from God. So you have to practice this in your everyday life. And when you interact with all types of living things with love, you elevate your vibrations. You, uh, you reach a higher vibration within, and when you meditate, then operating on that higher vibration, you can tune in and make contact very easily. Now, let's go back to that contact that was made in Sumer, Egypt, probably even before that. Right. And that brings us to the research that we've been both so actively involved in for so many years, and that's the star people. Right. Now, in the research, as it developed, you began to channel or tune in on the different types of star people that we were discovering. At this point in the research, how do you define the different types or, or levels or degrees? I don't know what word I'm looking for here, but how would you define the types of star people at this point? Well, there are two types of helpers on Earth, uh, the seeds, and both are star people, but they are, we call them the seeds and the helpers. And the seeds actually carry the genetic heritage of uh, contact that was probably made uh, thousands of years ago. And the helpers are earthlings that are merely highly evolutionized, so that they're tuned in to the same thing that the seeds are all about. They're tuned in to the higher consciousness, to uh, God's plan in the universe. There's a divine plan going on. And whenever you make contact uh, with your higher self, um, by going within, you actually become tuned in to the pattern of God, the purpose of God, the interacting with all things. And uh, when you interact in such a way, you gather the vibrations of a higher nature, which is the whole purpose of being, which is the divine plan. And these star people are about spreading this spreading the divine plan of God so that we all fulfill our destiny. Well, what now if someone comes to you and says, well, you know, I don't have an extra vertebrae. I, my blood pressure is kind of high. My body temperature is normal. I'm obviously not a seed. 
and I'm not certain if I'm a highly evolutionized earthling or not. Can I be a star person, or is this some exclusive club that only people who no. were born that way or have a special blessing can All enjoy? people can actually be star people, and that's what we're all about. We're trying to help everyone to reach a higher consciousness, to have a perspective of a holistic view of the world. Uh, the whole world will is actually one human race, and we will all be as one when perhaps we reach a higher uh, evolutionized type of standard of living where all people join together and we share in the bounties of the earth and we work together. It's uh, perhaps a, a very uh, beautiful picture that we are painting, but it is one that we can achieve and that we will achieve in the very near future because we're going to have to achieve it. We're going to have to achieve it to survive. We're going to have to achieve it to be able to spread all of the food and all of the uh, resources uh, around to all the people. Otherwise, uh, we're going to actually disintegrate eventually if we don't. If we don't work towards evolutionizing towards God, we will lead to our own destruction. Do you think when the ETs came here, thousands of years ago, that they had any particular plan in mind in regard to the planet? Now, you mentioned that uh, people bear the seeds, bear the genetic heritage of these people. Now, we can assume that was done through genetic engineering, perhaps. Uh, the holy books speak of, uh, of the seeing the daughters of men and, and giants in the earth being born from that kind of union. Did they have a plan other than just uh, propagating uh, an extension of their own heritage, or do you think they had a broader plan than that? They very definitely had a plan, um, those that visited back then, because they left a beautiful legacy. Uh, they elevated the consciousness and the awareness of the people so that they might be able to attain uh, all that God wished. When you took the PSE test, right. uh, that was a strenuous test tested by a man in, in military security who developed the psychological stress evaluator. And in that test, you spoke of going to outer space, or going out into space. Right. And they the indicated that you were telling the truth. Now, how would you explain to someone how you go to outer space? Do you get in a spaceship and do this? Or? Well, you go to outer space when you go within. It's a, a multi-dimensional thing, but when you meditate and you go within yourself, um, it really is true that there is a temple within. Uh, you can uh, attain this higher consciousness by going inside and, and in so doing you open up the entire universe to yourself. You actually feel that you are physically there because you're traveling spiritually. And it is the real you rather than the fleshly envelope that we occupy right now. The real you, uh, many times you can look back and see the physical shell. And this has been reported by so many people, it uh, almost seems redundant to say, but you can spiritually travel beyond, beyond the stars and the planets into, uh, into a beautiful space where you'll receive teachings and awarenesses that uh, aren't available here. Other people talk about going to outer space in UFOs after they've made contact. Do you think that kind of contact exists? I think it's very possible, since all things are possible under God. I feel that um, it's the symbolism in many cases. We have a, a subconscious mind uh, which uh, makes contact with the beyond quite easily. And our subconscious mind, which is uh, in contact, sees things and speaks to us consciously in symbol language. So that when uh, we are in contact with something from beyond, uh, it will cause an image to project to our conscious mind, and it will be an image that we will consciously accept. Our mind does this, and it's the language of the mind. It's how it speaks to us, and it uh, talks to us in our dreams. Mm -hmm. So you think these people who say they go on UFOs to outer space, you think that's more a dream experience or an out-of-body experience rather than an actual experience? I think it experience? could be going within uh, quite frequently and contacting the subconscious mind and uh, seeing all of these grand symbols and uh, taking them literally. And uh, I think in most cases it is that. There have been people that have made contact with extraterrestrial beings, and I believe them. Uh, many of those beings are 
not the same ones that uh, came a long time ago that actually aided our culture. These are, uh, as I've been told, they're beings that are merely studying us biologically. And as observing us then, uh, as mm -hmm. if we were uh, specimens? The same thing that we would do if we could go there. They're just ahead of us. <laughs> or the same things we might do if we went to uh, a place where um, certain rare animals might be in a game preserve type of well, thing? Well, also if we knew that they were warlike, which the Earth has shown throughout the centuries as being a very warlike planet, I don't think they would wish to overtly contact us, and I think that they would uh, get perhaps a better picture of us by at random, as they have been doing, biologically studying us. Like people say, you know, we've, why don't they land on the White House lawn? Why don't they make contact? Why don't they go right to the president and say, hey, we're here, we've been watching you, we've been studying you, knock off the, the dirty business that we're, is involved in so many levels of, a, of our Western world, of the Eastern world, of the entire planet. Just really get it together, Earth. Really clean up your act. Why, why don't you think that kind of contact has taken place? Oh, I think for so many reasons. Uh, it would be a, a personal thought of my own, perhaps, in that case. I, I believe that um, it would be very dangerous for them to do that because of the power structures that run this world, political power structures that run this world, uh, would not want anyone to come and topple what they have claimed as their own. If they would have such a superior technology, it would appear, uh, would they be threatened by, by any of our power structures? Uh, no, they would not be. Uh, but. Uh, our power structures would be, and I think that we would probably use uh, weapons against them so as not to uh, topple the uh, economy as they wish it. But could we even attempt to resist them? Oh, they're definitely destructible. Mm -hmm. So you feel then that they feel they should not interfere with our progress at this time? I but really, um, I wish that uh, they they could or that they would, uh, perhaps more overtly than they are. Uh, they're doing it the only way that they can at this time. They're entering into the psyches of our culture and they're affecting us through our media, through our entertainment, through uh, all, a lot of people think that it's their own idea, for instance, uh, that it was a, a hunch they got and they created a play or, or a particular uh, scene. But all of our creative, uh, abilities actually are affected by uh, higher intelligences from beyond. And uh, I think that's perhaps the most thorough way of affecting a culture rather than uh, by shocking them or by uh, overtly uh, coming upon them and telling them how they should live is by coming from within so, and changing the people from within. So you're saying then they don't have to land on the White House lawn and declare themselves. You're saying that they have made contact with humans for centuries. Right, and they are still doing this. They are still affecting us. The people they've made contact with, are these primarily our, our prophets, our, our leaders and, and political structures in the past, do you think? I think it's, Do you think some um, famous people in the past have had Very contact? definitely. I, I believe um, those people are what I term star people or people with star consciousness. Any person, any people that actually leads other human beings to higher awareness, that uses their energy, their electromagnetic energy within, and serves humanity with that energy within by reflecting God in what they do, all of those people, and I think perhaps anyone uh, could name as many as I could, there have been countless people that have affected our culture by channeling their energies from God and reflecting God in their everyday life. Uh, Moses, Muhammad, Jesus, Buddha, uh, Bernadette of Lourdes, Joan of Arc, all of these people, Nikola Tesla, they've all made contact with the beyond. And now, they've do all they make contact us. with ETs or with these multidimensional well, beings? Well, the ETs are more progressed than we are, and they've evolutionized to a higher state of being. But they're physical. They're physical. As we are. And they have become very aware of their multidimensional heritage, of their soul, of their higher self, of their purpose in being, of God. Mm -hmm. And therefore, 
they are in the same vein as the multidimensional beings or as our soul or as God. So I feel uh, like it is really a, a multidimensional educational system that's actually been perpetrated mm -hmm. upon Earth for countless years now. Do you think that the early humans in Earth's prehistory when they were confronted by or confronted aliens, ETs, that they may have thought they were gods or angels? Is that what led to some of the That's, uh, legends and folklore? It must have been people? what it was because of their descriptions. Uh, like uh, Sumer described them as uh, fishmen and uh, how they walked across the water from their star and uh, how they taught them uh, language, the written language, the cuneiform language. And the first word that man wrote in Sumer was star and talked all about these star people that came from the star. So I think that uh, all of the cultures spoke of this and thought of them in perhaps their own, just as we would today, in their own understanding, whether they called them angels or star people or whatever. It was in their own language. Now, many people fear, a, and still fear, a war of the worlds. Uh, many people feel that if ETs, aliens, come from another world, that they are here to do us harm, to enslave us, to, to take our world away from us. Do you think there's any danger of that? No, I really don't think that they would want it. So I, I don't feel there's any danger in them taking our world away. I feel that uh, where they come from is uh, far more advanced than our culture. I think they really just wish to aid us in raising our own awareness and and the only way that they can because uh, they're living their life and they must permit us to live ours and just try to help us along. You feel then that they're guiding us, perhaps giving us examples rather than uh, planning to interfere and, and pull us into the future against our will, so to speak? Well, they're making us want to go into the future, those people that are aware enough to be able to walk uh, towards the future. There are other people that, uh, no, I, I don't quite know what you're asking. Okay, let's turn the question around a bit. Uh, let's say, uh, okay, let's turn the question around. Okay. What level do you think our population is at at this time toward accepting alien contact? Let's say that the aliens did land. Let's say that the aliens approached a group of men and women in uh, certain structures of our society mm -hmm. and said, we are from another world, take us to your leader. How do you feel that the average person in the Western world will limit it, would react to alien contact? Well, I think after the Spielberg movies, uh, a lot of people would probably be a lot more accepting of uh, extraterrestrial contact. I, I feel that uh, he has done uh, a great deal to make us ready for this. Do you feel then that people would be more accepting or do you feel that there would still be those who would get their shotguns and try to dra drive the aliens back to whichever planet they may have come from? Well, if you go into the backwoods of uh, many places uh, in the United States um, where one is an alien, even though they're a United States citizen, someone can still get their shotgun and chase you away. There's always those people. Mm -hmm. But do you think the average uh, technological sophistication has uh, arisen enough so that th there would be a more uh, friendly approach on the part of the average person, a, m a more aware approach toward an alien? Yes, I think so. I think more people are accepting aliens and would interact with them in a friendly way. Now, when you were a, a child and you watched uh, some of the movies that we saw when we were kids. And the blob. It, like the, the blob thing. and the thing and the you know, the carrot that ate Detroit and those kinds right. of things. Uh, what was your reaction to that depiction of aliens? I hated them. I hated those movies. Uh, I only went because I could uh, at least see the first part of it and, uh, and I would cry inside because uh, I thought it was such an unfair depiction and it was always, I used to say, now how could that operate a ship? It has no hands, you know. How could it even get here? It was always so absurd. And you mean I, the giant I, cockroaches right. that landed in the I really resented it. Uh, right. Now, we've seen a, a changing in our, in our media. 
toward aliens. We've seen, uh, you mentioned the Spielberg film, E.T. You felt some years ago that there was going to be a, a more positive attitude in the media. What, what do you feel has brought that about? Right, I was, I was told uh, in the latter 50s, actually, that they were coming into our culture um, through the media, through television, uh, during the 60s. And um, during the 60s is when it actually began, and I was looking for it, and they told me that they would start affecting our children's programs first, and that they would, uh, as the children grew older, be affecting our adults' programs as well by entering into the minds of men and causing them to become more aware of a more holistic approach to humanity. And you feel that they have actually influenced the minds of, of certain producers and directors and writers and musicians? Well, not, um, and let me make clear, not just the ETs, but the higher selves of the ETs and the higher selves of the human beings that are becoming more evolutionized, that tuned in uh, to themselves, to their higher consciousness. That's really what's affecting it, not just extraterrestrial visitors. Do you feel that someday the ETs will come and great arcs and land and, and take all the people who believe in them or all the nice people of earth off the planet to another world? I know we differ in this because <laughs> we've discussed this a bit. Um, that's the um, mental image, the symbol system and the symbol pictures that uh, almost every one of the star people <laughs> were really receiving that, that the, they're going to have a mass landing and we'll all be taken aboard the rescue ships and get off of this forsaken place. Um, well, I understand it as a symbol, but what does the symbol mean, do you think? I think probably most of the star people hope that it's true, but if it isn't, then we're going to keep trying to make this planet a better place to live in and try and make it reflect God as much as possible and fulfill our destiny and our mission here. And uh, in so doing, maybe we won't have to go somewhere else to find peace and love. It will actually be here on Earth. And isn't that why they perhaps chose to intervene with us in the first place? To, to intervene in, in the very function of this planet is so that we could learn to accept the challenges of this earth and to tend our own garden so that we could become responsible members of uh, a larger universe? That sounds very good. <laughs> <laughs> Prophets teachers, and inspired men and women from all cultures have sought to enlighten humankind with a message that we can become more things than we can imagine. There are more processes which take place within us than we know. We are all multidimensional beings, and we have the ability to learn a psycho-spiritual discipline so that we can control a marvelous universal energy in order to achieve self-mastery and to work miracles. The Hindus named it prana, the Jews ruah, the Chinese chi, the Japanese ki, the Polynesians mana, the Christians the Holy Spirit. All people at one time or another have sensed an unknown force that underlies all paranormal phenomena and that permeates all life on earth. The ability to control this energy exists in a dormant state in the psyche of every human being. Awareness is the key that unlocks the door to this limitless potential. In these remarkable photographs, we see Olaf Johnson, the psychic sensitive who participated with astronaut Ed Mitchell in the Moon to Earth ESP experiments during the flight of Apollo 14 demonstrating his control of the X-Force under laboratory conditions. Together with other sensitives serving as batteries, Olaf levitates first a table, then a man. Six cameras recorded the experiments on infrared film in the darkened parapsychological laboratory of Danish researcher Sven Turk. Olaf told me of his activating experience at the age of five when an intelligence from 
somewhere beyond the stars, contacted him in his native Sweden. Olaf said, it was they who began telling me about the universe and cosmic harmony. I felt that they were friends, that they wanted to teach me and to help me. I am still convinced that they are friendly and that they intend to help humans as much as they can without interfering in our own development and free will. Israeli sensitive Uri Geller is another who experienced an activating incident as a child and who has freely admitted to being the channel for an external intelligence. Here Uri makes a fork bend merely by stroking it with thumb and forefinger. The dinner fork verified as intact before the controlled demonstration, gradually became pliable at his neck and finally parted. Admittedly, bending dinner forks with the psyche has a very limited social application, but such demonstrations as those by Geller do inspire others to begin their own efforts to control the X-Force in more meaningful applications. It should be pointed out here that a negative application of this unknown energy can express itself in those violent, chaotic manifestations which we label the poltergeist. Our friend Komar was activated through dream teachings as a child and has experienced ET contact as an adult. Komar channels the energy of his cosmic heritage by controlling pain through altered states of consciousness, then teaching others how to accomplish these mind over matter abilities. Komar can so demonstrate this facet of our star-seeded potential to the extent of walking on coals at temperatures as high as 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit to the satisfaction of committees of medical doctors. Komar's pain control feats have earned him several listings in the Guinness Book of Records. When Dr. Norman Sheely of the Pain Rehabilitation Center, St. Francis Hospital, La Crosse, Wisconsin, examined Komar, he stated, quote, it is obvious that Komar has the ability to distract his mind from going into at least an alpha state, and in it to have control over his autonomic nervous system. Komar uses this state of mind to prevent pain and body damage, end of quote. What Komar really seeks to accomplish in his public demonstrations is to shock people into realizing that they live their entire lives without using more than a small percentage of their full mental capacities. He's challenging everyone that if he can utilize a portion of that dormant brain power, so can we. Komar is a master at demonstrating that the conduit for the X-Force, the mana, the prana, the key, is the human psyche. Some researchers believe that a biological transformation is taking place in humankind at this time. Powerful energies are circulating that, if properly balanced, can create manifestations of great psychic experiences and physical abilities. Some men and women can interact with the X-Force and use it to locate water, oil, precious metals, or lost persons. In these photographs, we watch as a dowser holds her familiar fork stick in the air, waiting for it to become energized. Next, the camera records not only a bright corona around the tip of the stick, but a comet-like ray beneath it that seems to be pulling the dowsing rod after it. Scientists have observed the X-Force in the operation of heat, light, electricity, magnetism, and chemical reactions. It is, however, different from all of them. It fills all of space, penetrating and permeating everything. Denser materials appear to conduct it better and faster, and metal refracts it. Organic material absorbs it. This photograph represents a successful attempt to capture a man's aura on film. The aura is said to be that pattern of electromagnetic energy that surrounds all living things. The process known as Curlian photography strives to provide yet another means of better defining humankind's multidimensional nature. At the same time, if certain colors in the aura can reflect changes in moods and in 
bodily health, then medical doctors will be equipped with yet another tool for treating emotional and physical disorders. Interestingly, the X-Force appears to have its opposite number. The life-giving energy is seen as blue and gives a cool, pleasant feeling. The disintegrative energy is reddish and creates a feeling of heat and unpleasantness. In utilizing the X-Force, the kahunas, high priests of the Polynesians, say that the energy flows from one object to another. The mana, they say, is sticky. So an invisible stream of energy will always connect any two objects that have in any way been connected in the past. This is the basis of what is known as sympathetic magic. The interaction of the human psyche with the X-Force is observable in several ways as isolated pulsating points, as spirals, as a cloud-like substance, or as an aura surrounding the body. This remarkable photograph, not a double exposure, was taken during a meeting of the Psychic Research Training Center at St. Louis, Missouri. Maureen Garger, a healer, had as her goal the releasing of energy into a man who was sitting several feet in front of her. Although she sat quite still, a transparent arm, clearly not the man's, appears just to the left of his own arm. Just to the left of his head can be seen an upturned face with mouth open and eyes closed superimposed over the healer's physical neck, which is slumped forward. The physical and the non-physical not only interpenetrate one another, they are each other. On March 29, 1964, psychical researcher Faye Clark conducted a number of experiments in aura photography in a darkened fallout shelter. The only source of light for the entire area came from a watt and a half argon bulb. On this particular evening, Clark had brought with him an ultrasound generator into the shelter. He moved the sound generator to various frequencies, and at one particular setting, a number of dots of light began to appear. They would group themselves in formation, and in some cases, grow larger. Some of them developed tails. At times, they appeared to be responding to his thoughts. Clark almost experienced the eerie feeling that the lights were somehow intelligent. Did Clark in some way summon UFO intelligences by striking a particular homing frequency that enabled them to enter our world and to interact with him on some level of consciousness? And note the similarity between Clark's fireflies and the famous UFO formation seen over Lubbock, Texas, and the group of UFOs which appeared over Washington, D.C. on February 4th, 1959 and set off a red alert. In the late 1930s, a French psychical researcher claimed to have produced electrical ghost forms by directing light and sound vibrations into a variable and sensitive magnetic field. Nature's way of scattering huge amounts of electricity around is usually an electrical storm with brilliant bolts of lightning. Traditionally, we think of the spooky, ghost-ridden nights as being those occasions when thunder and lightning rumble and flash. Mediums seem to favor holding seances on evenings when the air is heavy with electrical vibrations. Rather than eerie bits of folklore, we may have been witnessing the electrical connection in operation for centuries. UFOs are often reported hovering near high-tension power lines. Rather than their kidnapping our kilowatts, as some researchers have suggested, I think that it is likely that the electrical field near the power lines enables them to enter our reality and to become visible to witnesses' eyes. A number of UFO contactees have mentioned to me that just prior to the manifestation of the communicating ET, they were aware of a strange buzzing sound. Witnesses of aerial phenomena have also referred to a buzzing or rushing shortly before a UFO appeared over them. I am also reminded that a great deal of poltergeist activity produces a preparatory signal of a buzzing, rasping, or winding noise. 
could it be possible that the human observers of such paranormal activity are hearing some dimension hopping entity tuning in to our frequency before materializing in our space-time continuum? Could the sounds and lights which seem so mysterious to us be but simple electronic byproducts? And if these sounds and lights might somehow be channeled electronically, shouldn't it be possible for us to fashion a device to permit us to communicate with their dimension? The answer to that fascinating question is quite probably yes. And that may be one of the giant steps toward which the ETs and other multidimensional intelligences may be leading us. They may even now be stimulating certain electronic geniuses among us to devote their energies to the fashioning of an instrument that might serve as a medium of communication between the different levels of frequency, vibration, or whatever, which separate us from the other intelligences in the greater reality. It seems to me that throughout history, the UFO intelligences have often cast themselves in the role of teachers. But rather than instructing us through direct intervention, they seem to favor teaching by example. They have done this before by demonstrating the possibility of air flight, radio communication, television, and a host of other technological developments that humankind once considered impossible. At this moment in our scientific progression, the UFO intelligences may be demonstrating the possibility of dematerialization and rematerialization. Perhaps they are showing us that with a particular electronic device at our command, we would simply tune in to one another rather than only randomly catching each other unaware. If we may theorize that there is but one life force and a common collective unconscious for our species, then in the larger sense, any contact with multidimensional intelligences or ETs becomes part of the common experience of all humankind. There is a new age dawning, and each of us must be prepared to become an integral part of it. Man and woman must come together as plus and minus, positive and negative, balancing their polarities, blending their energies, becoming as one in mission and purpose. For the evolutionary goal of 20th century humankind is the transcendence of our species. Right now a child is being born and it is emerging humankind. Our eyes and our ears are just beginning to open. Our nervous system is just beginning to coordinate. When we fully realize that humankind is a transitional species, literally the link between the animal and the angel, we will be forced into the universe. With understanding, with love, we may progress out of our old physical limitations and rise into a higher realm that is ours by right of our cosmic inheritance. Through this spiritual catharsis of dreams, visions, and inspirations, together with the guidance of multidimensional beings and ETs, each man and each woman may attain star birth into the universe.